We will gavel in and begin. At this hearing, uh, we are fully virtual, so we have to address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they are not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice when you are recognized that you have not unmuted yourself, I may ask the staff to send you a request to unmute yourself. Please accept that request. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there's a technology issue, we'll move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will begin with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized. House rules require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members may send anything they wish to submit in writing for any of the subcommittee's hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. The subcommittee shall come to order. Good morning. Today we welcome the United States Secretary of Commerce, Ms. Gina Raimondo, in her second appearance before the subcommittee to testify on the Department of Commerce's fiscal year 2023 budget request. Madam Secretary, since we last convened, it would be safe to say that you've had a very busy year. Uh, and I wanna begin by applauding the Department of Commerce for moving swiftly to implement export restrictions on Russia and Belarus, as well as adding hundreds of Russian and Belarusian entities to the department's entity list in response to the vile and unpro unprovoked attack on Ukraine. This subcommittee is eager to hear more about how the Ukraine related resources the administration received in March will be utilized to prevent Russia and Belarus from receiving the tools and technologies of war. The president's fiscal year 2023 budget request of 11.7 billion total for the Department of Commerce represents a $1.8 billion increase for the department's important and diverse missions, which are all critical to the quality of life of the American people and America's competitiveness in the world. As our nation continues to recover from the global pandemic, the department plays an important role to help strengthen and secure our supply chains as well as keep American businesses successful in the global market. The president's FY23 request includes an almost 20% increase for the International Trade Administration, including a $10.9 million increase to strengthen supply resilience across manufacturing and service industries, and to support the department's efforts on behalf of the semiconductor industry. And I look forward to hearing more about those new initiatives. It's also no secret that our global competitors and adversaries often seek to undermine or circumvent our trade laws, steal our intellectual property and impose retaliatory tariffs or other trade barriers. I also look forward to hearing how the department's re request will protect American businesses from international practices that hurt their bottom lines and their workers. This budget also focuses on making strong local impacts with a 30% increase for the Economic Development Administration, investing more in public works, research and development, and regional job growth strategies will help put us in solid shape for years to come. Now turning to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, this subcommittee will be asking you, Secretary Raimondo, about a number of investments planned to improve our understanding of climate and weather systems. 
Every day we hear about catastrophic droughts and fires, floods. New studies about the state of nature confirm that a fifth of all species on earth are at risk of extinction. Coral reefs in the Florida Keys have only 2% of their historic amount of coral remaining. So it's time for us to see just how much trouble we're in. NOAA is the agency in the federal government responsible for telling us about climate science research. NOAA makes America the leader in the world in climate science research. And so NOAA needs to help us plan new infrastructure that is adequately, adequately resilient. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is going to fund historic construction, but those hundreds of billions of dollars need to be spent wisely and efficiently. Five years ago, the prevailing estimates for sea level rise by 2050 varied between six inches and as much as two feet. That was a huge range to consider if you were an Oceanside city mayor trying to make decisions about coastal infrastructure. Today, with some modest investment in ocean science at NOAA by this subcommittee, the 2022 sea level rise reports tells us with great certainty that by 2050, sea level will rise between 10 and 12 inches. That is a scientific leap in predictive accuracy that is invaluable as communities plan to protect their shorelines. It gives them a chance to proceed with construction uh, that is wise and can be effective for decades. So the steps your budget takes to advance climate research and related services are the right ones. They will provide a return on investment that we would be foolish not to pursue. Madam Secretary, we will explore these topics further, but at this time, I'd like to yield to my distinguished ranking member, Mr. Adderholt, for his statement. You recognize Mr. Adderholt. Thank you for yielding, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, and I appreciate you holding this uh, hearing today, and I too would like to welcome our uh, special uh, guest uh, before the subcommittee, uh, the Secretary of Commerce, uh, Secretary Raimondo. Uh, and uh, especially as we discuss the FY 2023 discretionary budget. The last two years have seen Congress, and particularly it has seen the majority in Congress, enact direct spending that in some cases has far eclipsed the annual discretionary budgets that this committee negotiated for uh, the Commerce Bureau. And I wholeheartedly support the department's mission of promoting job creation and also economic competitiveness but it's uh, been hard to watch this majority and, the, and this administration ignore clear economic projections that warned excessive spending, such as uh, of the so-called American Rescue Plan that would trigger historical inflation. Today, these predictions have come to pass. Inflation remains near a 40-year high, and many economists worry that a recession is out there looming. While some of the supplemental spending has been directed toward missions of the Commerce Department that I hold in very high regard, I believe it's vital that Congress reject this trend of overspending. Even before the outbreak of COVID-19, the federal budget was on an unsustainable path due to the growth of the outpacing the growth of the uh, economy. I believe we as members of the Preparations Committee can and will agree on some responsible spending to continue advancing manufacturing and innovation, also improving weather forecasting and also enhancing trade enforcement and compliance. Just to name a few of the Department of Commerce efforts that are, worried of con are worthy of continued investment. Beyond fostering jobs and opportunities for the people of the state of Alabama and across the country, the Commerce Department also oversees many other important programs, and this includes many critical activities at NOAA. The important work is uh, being done in uh, Alabama by the Alabama Water Center and by the Vortex Southeast Program, and they remain critical to the people of the, my district and my state. I look forward to discussing many important matters with you today, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, I have some questions about securing our supply chain, 
implementation of CHIPS for America Act and several other critical activities at NOAA, among other things. I stand uh, ready, willing to work with uh, Chairman Cartwright to continue making America industry our top priority. We must continue to focus on addressing unfair trade practices and barriers that harm U.S. workers and businesses. In addition, strong export controls are needed to hold Russia accountable for its unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and match the enormity of the threat posed by China. Finally, we must never lose sight of the consequences of runaway federal spending and the hardship felt across the American communities and industries as this persistent yet predictable inflation takes its toll on this nation. Uh, I do appreciate uh, you being uh, uh, here with us uh, before the subcommittee today, Madam Secretary, uh, and uh, for you to answer our questions. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Adderholt. Uh, Secretary Raimondo, you are now recognized for your opening remarks. Uh, please try to keep your statements to five minutes, and as always, your full written statement will be included in the record. You are recognized. Well, good morning, Chair. It is uh, great to see you, albeit virtually, and I very much appreciate this opportunity to be with the committee today and Ranking Member Adderholt uh, and all the members of the committee. Thank you for your time this morning. Um, I suppose I'll pick up on where you both left off and say that the priorities funded in this budget and the president's budget build upon the investments that you enacted last year. And I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to you for your support as we look forward to accomplishing even more in the year ahead. Um, as the chair mentioned, this budget request includes $11.7 billion for the department, which is an 18% increase above 2022's enacted level. Um, we have here at the Commerce Department one overarching goal. Even though we have a, a, a broad array of uh, activities that we engage in here at Commerce, the through line is that everything we do is directed at improving America's competitiveness so that our workers and our companies and small businesses can succeed in the global economy. In these opening comments, I'm just going to focus quickly on the six key areas of investment that are in the president's uh, proposal. First, and you both mentioned this, the budget strengthens the nation's supply chains by investing in domestic manufacturing. Specifically, it calls for one and a half billion dollars to support the work of NIST, including 275 million for the Manufacturing Extension Program, MEP, and nearly 100 million to expand NIST's role in Manufacturing USA. These investments will very directly enable us to strengthen domestic supply chains and help small and medium-sized manufacturers improve <clears throat> their competitiveness. The budget also proposes 16 million to augment the Commerce Department's data tools and expertise as it relates to supply chains. Secondly, uh, the budget positions us to compete globally, protect our national security, which you both mentioned, and continue to lead the global coalition united in condemnation of Russian aggression, as the chair said, vile aggression against Ukraine. Specifically, it calls for $630 million for ITA to enhance commercial diplomacy and export promotion. It provides BIS $200 million to enforce export controls and strengthen efforts to counter the threats from Russia and China. Third, this budget invests in inclusive economic growth for all Americans. Uh, the budget provides 500 million for EDA to help communities experiencing economic distress and 100 million for MBDA. Fourth, the budget takes historic action to combat the climate crisis. It includes $7 billion for NOAA to continue to provide data, research, strategies, and expertise necessary to address the climate crisis. And it proposes $87 million for the Office of Space commerce 
Um, this significant increase will specifically be dedicated to standing up a civil operational space situational awareness capability at NOAA. I will say, and in reference to the chair's comments, the NOAA request will support programs to catalyze wind energy, offshore wind, restore habitats, protect oceans and coasts, and greatly improve NOAA's ability to predict extreme weather associated with climate change. Fifth, the budget expands opportunity and discovery through data. Specifically, it provides the Census Bureau with one and a half billion dollars to continue its trans transformation to a 21st century data-centric model and calls for 141 billion for the Bureau of Economic Analysis to support new data specifically into supply chains. Finally, and six, the budget ensures the department can provide 21st century service to the American public by proposing new funds to enhance our own cybersecurity. Um, so with that, obviously, these are the key priorities and I'm you know, looking forward to answering your questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, at this time, we'll begin our, our round of first round of questions. Uh, I begin by recognizing myself for uh, five minutes. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, we have a real supply chain issue that is obviously having a direct impact on the American public. Uh, with inflation now at 8.3%, we need to talk about the department's role here. And so the question for you is, how is the United States Department of Commerce currently contributing to American efforts to identify and address supply chain vulnerabilities that were exacerbated both by the pandemic and by Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Yes, thank you. Uh, as you say, inflation is real. And you know I hear it every day from American families who are struggling. I'm sure you all do in your districts. At this point, the Commerce Department right now has over 40 work streams on working, where we're working on supply chain disruptions. The, the biggest area of focus is on semiconductors, but we're also you know, looking across industries. Um, I, we also resolved the 232 tariffs on aluminum and steel, which was helping combat inflation, but also deal with supply chains. I would say that the budget, the president's budget calls for $16 million and another 50 people to help us respond to the current supply chain crisis, including the disruption related to Russia and Ukraine. Um, I would also I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, in your, version, in your uh, competes bill or the Senate's USICA bill, it calls for the creation of a supply chain office here at the Department of Commerce. That is vitally necessary. If we've learned anything in the past two years, it's that the federal government is under-resourced. Under what we need to be doing is not just responding to crises, but proactively mapping, monitoring, predicting bottlenecks, investing to help small and medium-sized manufacturers, convening suppliers and consumers to increase transparency. So we predict bottlenecks and really smooth out um, the log jams that we're suffering from now in these supply chains. Well, thank you for that answer. It is it's hard to imagine, but it's hard to forget that two years ago, our grocery store shelves were empty and we were bartering with our neighbors for toilet paper, of all things. And today, Again, going to the supply chain problem, parents are desperately driving hours to find baby formula. Uh, and of course, gas prices are at record highs and it's painful every time you fill up. What investments in your FY 2023 budget request will ensure that our supply chain is more resilient and we won't continue to face these types of issues in the future? Yes, uh, so the budget provides for $16 million to help us do a better job uh, analyzing supply chains and convening industry, uh, just as you say. So we will be hiring economists, analysts, using more sophisticated software and data. 
uh, relying on experts and supply chains so that we can um, you know, constantly track these disruptions. I will say America is behind many other countries. Japan, for example, obviously a much smaller country, has dozens of people uh, analyzing just the semiconductor industry. Germany, same thing, has a whole department analyzing supply chains and making uh, small grants and loans to small manufacturers. So the 16 um, million being called for is critically necessary and it will all be you know, focused on supply chains. All right, now I wanna uh, switch over to uh, uh, Russia and Belarus. Export controls on Russia and Belarus have been used extensively as part of the sanctions package put in place in response to Russia's war against Ukraine. And uh, Madam Secretary, we appreciate your appearing at our classified security briefings uh, on that horrible problem. Back in March, we provided $22 million to the Bureau of Industry and Security to aid in those efforts about the sanction package, including export controls. Can you provide an update to our committee on how these funds will be used and what commerce has done to work with our allies to confront this unprovoked aggression against the people of Ukraine. Thank you. First of all, thank you for the money and the support. I mean, I cannot thank all of you enough. Uh, we have, uh, you should be, I think, I hope you're proud of the work we've done. We've imposed the most expansive export controls ever in the history of our country levied against another country. Uh, and we've done that as you, with our allies. The United States led a coalition of 37 countries, all of Europe, Japan, you know, 37 other countries that have aligned with us to using export controls to deny Russia technology, maritime equipment, aerospace equipment, military equipment, and as a result, uh, exports of technology from the U.S. to Russia are down by 70% since we started. Exports of controlled items are down 99%. And you're seeing it, you see it in Russia. They've shut down tank factories, shut down auto manufacturing factories, shut down airlines. Um, they're not able to replenish. So I'm, I'm grateful for the extra money in the Ukraine supplemental. And uh, now we're just very focused on enforcement so nobody can get around our controls. That's great. Thank you for the answer and let's keep the pressure on Russia. At this time, I recognize our ranking member, Mr. Adderhold for five minutes of questions. Thank you, oh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, I wanna ask about um, oh, critical minerals. Uh, the United States is 100% uh, import aligned on about 14 minerals uh, that are on the critical mineral list. Last November, uh, I believe you met with the, uh, you met in Singapore with Australia's Minister for Trade and Tourism and Investment and discussed, among other topics, building uh, resilient supply chains in the Indo-Pacific Indio and the importance of cooperation between allies regarding critical minerals to offset our, alliance, our reliance on China. Can you give us just a brief update on uh, that uh, uh, working group between the US and Australia, uh, critical minerals uh, group that was uh, formed there that y'all's discussion? Yes, thank you um, for the question. As you say, we did form that working group. I did with my counterpart. And then I convened here at the Commerce Department uh, more than a dozen CEOs from Australian critical minerals companies and U.S. companies. I think, uh, I think we're off to a very strong start. The U.S. is vulnerable in that we're overly reliant on China for critical minerals. And so what we're trying to do is forge a closer relationship with our allies in Australia so we can have, a you know, I guess, a partnership with their with their companies, increase processing here in the US and give them like certainty that we'll consume a certain amount. So I think it's early, but we have made progress. And if we can be more reliant on our allies and less reliant on China, that will help our national security. Oh, do you have a plan to target any other regions? 
sorry. Uh, yes, actually, thank you. One of the initiatives that we are working on is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And uh, we are having discussions with Japan, for example, uh, Indonesia, which has a great deal of nickel. Um, so short answer is yes, we're trying to um, you know, wean ourselves from being so dependent on China. Oh, global demand for critical minerals is set to uh, skyrocket by 400 to 600% over the next decades. And for some minerals, such as lithium and graphite, it could be as much as 4,000%, I understand. What effect would these increases have on uh, our economy, uh, absent the fact that we don't uh, have increased domestic capacity? Yeah, great question. So this is exactly why we need the supply chain office that is contemplated in the uh, Competition Act. Uh, the United States, we know this is a vulnerability, so we need to get ahead of it. We need to make plans for uh, working with our allies, mapping the supply chain, figuring out where the holes are, and coming up with partnerships with other like-minded allied countries to increase supply. And we are doing it now, but as I said earlier to the chair, we're under-resourced and other countries have full-time operations doing nothing but supply chain management. So I do hope that you are able to pass the, the USICA bill or competition bill so the United States can catch up. Would you support efforts to increase capacity by ramping up refining and mining of critical minerals, uh, similar to what uh, is being done in Alabama, uh, where a first of its kind graphite processing plant is being constructed in uh, one of our counties, Coosa County, Alabama, to produce essential material for electric vehicle batteries? Yes, I'm not familiar with that specific example, but I'd be very happy to work with you on it. There is no question whether it's semiconductors, uh, EV batteries, pharmaceuticals, we need more domestic production. All right, I, uh, I've, I've got an, I'll, I'll wait for my next round for my next question, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Mr. Adderholt, at this time, the chair recognizes uh, Congresswoman Meng of New York for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary Raimondo, for being here today. Uh, as you know, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration plays a leading role by overseeing the implementation of broadband programs established under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. As you know, that bill provides NTIA uh, $48.2 billion in new federal money to help states close the digital divide and ensure everyone has internet access. Successful implementation will hinge on NTIA having sufficient staff to ensure programs like the B program, middle mile grants, digital equity programs, and the tribal broadband connectivity program are effectively implemented. Um, can you talk about how the fiscal year 23 budget request will ensure that they have the personnel to effectively implement these programs and will staff who are brought on to manage these programs uh, be converted into different positions once the money uh, is spent? Yes, thank you, good morning. Uh, so good news on this, by the way, Congress required us to get the notice of funding opportunity on the B program out by May 16th. And I'm proud to say we're gonna hit that deadline. So I wanna say thank you to my staff. Uh, all of the money for the extra staff, and by the way, we've already hired over uh, dozens of people, just under 100 people. Um, all of the money for that is included in the bipartisan infrastructure law. So at this point, um, we feel supported. We have the team that we need. Um, and I think we're going to need them for years to come because this is a, you know, this is a long time investment of such a historic number. Thanks. Um, so do we know how NTIA is going to reach out to communities um, if they need support in multiple languages uh, other than English? Yes, great, great question. So first of all, um, every single state by tomorrow, 
every single state will have a point person in our office at NTIA that they can call. So we want to make sure that it's like one-stop shopping. So New York will have a human being whose job it is to just deal with partners on the ground uh, in New York. And we have a, an extensive outreach effort to deal with stakeholders on the ground, whether it's for, you know, non-English, you know, every state is different, the needs are different. So we're just relying heavily on teams on the ground interfacing with us. Great, would love to work with um, them and thank you. Um, I just wanna switch gears really quickly um, about 3D printed guns. Uh, last year, the Commerce Department posted a rule that I worry is too lenient. Uh, Commerce Department has regulated the code that can be inserted into a 3D printing machine, but they failed to regulate the code that can be uh, readily converted uh, into that code. For instance, someone could post a file online in a CAD format with a link to free software that converts CAD format into machine readable format. Uh, and these files would not be, the files themselves would not be regulated. And I know this is super technical, um, but as I'm hearing about this, I, I think that the consequence of getting this wrong could be deadly. Um, can you comment on the issue of 3D printed guns and make a commitment here to maybe fix that potential nuance um, so that we can continue to work to keep these guns off the streets? Thank you for the question. And as you say, it is technical. Uh, I can tell you that I know the president of the Department of Justice just put out in April new ghost gun regulations. And what I will commit to you here is to look further into this and the issue that you just said to make sure there's no gap between how we regulate and DOJ and ATF's new domestic transfer regulations. So I'll, I'll commit to you that there's no loophole. You should know, just as my own, I guess, values, as the governor of Rhode Island, I supported, pushed for, and signed a bill into law that uh, outlawed 3D guns in Rhode Island. So I'm totally with you and committed to it. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Congresswoman Meng. At this time, the chair recognizes Mr. Klein of Virginia for five minutes, he recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Raimondo for being here today. Uh, Madam Secretary, the Economic Development Administration received $3 billion from the American Rescue Plan. Can you talk about how much of those ARP funds remain unobligated at this point? Thank you. They will all be obligated by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we have a billion dollars out in the Build Back Better Regional Challenge. We've already put out 750 million in the travel and tourism. We have a half a billion out on uh, the good jobs challenge. So we are, we're gonna hit the deadline uh, and, and we're just in the middle now of the application process for the Build Back Better challenge and the good jobs challenge. My understanding it's, it's around 2 billion out of the 3 billion that you've gotten from ARP that's still unobligated. And with inflation surging and, and this large amount uh, yet to be obligated. How how is there a request for an additional 500 million for the EDA and FY23? How do you justify that? Well, these are so it's not two billion, but I can you know follow up exactly with the details. Thank you. Um, uh, the additional request. I mean, this is core economic development. This is, and I saw this as a governor, and I'm sure this place is in Virginia. There are, there are communities who. Uh, who need help with economic development. So this isn't, I wouldn't say this is inflationary, this isn't consumption, this is investment in communities to help them to create jobs. So I don't, um, I don't have a concern about it as it relates to inflation and it's our job to make sure it's invested in a way that does produce jobs and contribute to economic growth. Well, I'm interested in some of the allocations within your budget uh, when inflation is so critical at this point. 
uh, asking for seven billion in funding for NOAA, uh, roughly fifty nine percent of the entire budget requested uh, is is dealing with uh, climate change. While Americans are struggling and seeing their paychecks shrink, uh, a twenty four percent increase over FY twenty one levels for NOAA. Uh, doesn't really help families put food on the table or clothes on the back at a time when inflation is at a 40-year high. Can you talk about how this massive allocation of funds helps to combat inflation or deal with supply chain issues that you say are so important? Yes. So, look, we, we, we believe climate change is an existential threat. So, you know, children won't forget about clothes on their back. They're not going to be able to have a life if we don't deal with climate change. Well, my uh, constituents can't forget about the need to put clothes on their kids back right now. And climate change, as you say, being an existential uh, threat, uh, it is not going to solve the problem of making sure the kids are, are clothed and fed and off to school. Right. And we're, you know, the EDA, what we were just talking about, some of it goes into coal communities where folks don't have jobs. And so to put clothes on their back, we're going to create jobs there, but we have to do both. And I believe also a lot of the money into NOAA will be job creative. You know, I saw this in Rhode Island, resiliency, doing resiliency, coastal resiliency, adaptation creates jobs. Some of the fastest growing parts of our economy are in the green economy, creating jobs. So again, I don't think they are, inflation is real. I am not diminishing that. But uh, these are job creating investments, not consumption kind of spending that would lead to inflation. One of the things I'm, I'm gonna stay on this climate change issue because in your budget priorities, climate change is mentioned more than uh, twice as much as, as supply chain challenges. Now you're proposing a rapid energy transition uh, where it's, it's abundantly clear that we're gonna be depending on China countries like China to pursue these climate goals. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering why uh, at a time when we have such pressing issues on our economy uh, that we're so focused on, on these climate change ish issues. Um, I'd, I'd be happy for you to respond. Yes. So as I said, climate change, we can't delay any more on climate change. But I also, as I said, pass the Competes Act. If we're going to fix our supply chains, if we're going to be less reliant on China, if we're going to protect ourselves from threats, pass Competes so we actually have the tools we need to make chips in America, deal with our supply chain issues, enhance critical minerals and raw materials in the US. Well, we, we end on a point of um, bipartisanship on that. I share your support for that and hope we can get that done. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Klein. The chair recognizes uh, Mr. Case for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Madam Secretary, sorry for my voice. Um, I'd like to talk to you about an industry that is critical to my state and to the country, and that is travel and tourism. Um, as you know, travel and tourism has been among the most heavily impacted uh, industries in our entire world and certainly in this country. Uh, because of COVID-19, uh, travel and tourism before COVID-19 was, was our largest uh, service sector industry. It was uh, somewhere around 27% of our total services exports. People want to visit this country, and that's an export industry. And it was 10% of total exports. I think that figure often surprises people because they think of exports as being more manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, travel and tourism is a critical export industry. Um, we seem to be recovering in it. And, and in my Hawaii, uh, travel and tourism is somewhere around 25% of our total uh, economy and much more if you take the magnifying effects of that. Uh, and of travel and tourism in Hawaii, somewhere around one third is international travel from places like Japan, but also elsewhere in Asia. Um, and the fact of the matter is that although it seems domestic travel and tourism, is coming back pretty well. Um, that's not an export industry. Um, and what we are not seeing come back is international travel and tourism. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. Uh, but um, you know, the one that I want to focus on in particular with you 
um, is the fact that what is really hampering international travel and tourism is, is the inconsistency in, in admission or entry and return requirements around the world for international uh, travelers. And so, uh, for example, uh, somebody could come from Japan into Hawaii, they would still have to pass our still existing uh, restrictions as to you know, conditions of entry. Uh, but they would have a different set of requirements going back to Japan. And so although they may, come, may be able to come into Hawaii fairly easily or anywhere else in the country, they couldn't go home. And of course, every country needs sovereignty. Every country needs to write its own rules. And every country has, has, has done a different calculation in, in, throughout COVID-19. But the fact of the matter is that the inconsistency uh, from country to country is what is creating a lot of the the um, uh, hindrance and obstacles to recovering international travel and tourism. And you, of course, are deeply involved in this. You're, you're tra chair of the Travel and Tourism Advisory Council. Um, Department of Commerce has your own international travel and tourism office or travel and tourism office. What say you about travel and tourism and how to get us back to some kind of normal and how specifically to crack through some of these um, restrictions out there? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. And I understand how important travel and tourism is, you know, for your state in particular. So first I'll say the administration's committed to a coordinated and complete recovery from COVID. And you're pointing out the coordination part of it. I will tell you that I recently convened two weeks ago, the Travel and Tourism Board, which I, you know, oversee. And I heard a lot of concern about, about the CDC's international testing requirements uh, and the fact that the United States is unusual in requiring the testing to come here. So I can assure you, I raised those concerns on behalf of the industry within the administration and conveyed the concerns to, I met with the Xi Jia and conveyed those concerns. So I think we should just continue to work together and I'm happy to meet with you separately um, so that, you know, so that we can do everything we need to do so that, you know, we can get international travel back where we need it to be. Yeah, I mean, and that is that is true. The fact of the matter is that we impose a, um, a double requirement um, on, on, on entry into this country, whereas many of the other countries in the world don't have that anymore. They would accept a, a, a vaccination, a card as as uh, as comfort enough without an actual test. And so um, we're doing ourselves some harm in doing that. Now, if there's a good scientific reason for doing it, then we should do it. But the fact of the matter is that both federally and at state and county government levels, we are we are accepting far less of a requirement to go into a restaurant uh, to to go from you know one state to another state. And so the question does, have to be asked, is this is this too much under these circumstances? But let me ask you about the second point, and that is trying to get to some kind of an harmonized understanding and agreement across the world of, of, of what actually will be required uh, to go uh, from country to country, come into this country, or for that matter, to go home. Have there been discussions within commerce about coordinating that around the world? Yes, yes. As I said, we're committed to a coordinated recovery, and we are working on that. The, you know, the COVID work of the administration is being driven out of the White House. But as I said, I am um, involved in definitely raising the concerns of travel and tourism to, to the administration. Okay, thank you. I would love to work with you on that. And then let me switch gears and go back to the ranking members questions on the Indo-Pacific in particular. Um, you have proposed in your budget to increase the international trade administrations, um, uh, funding and authority for the projection of uh, US uh, foreign commercial officers and um, other, other personnel uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere in the world uh, to enhance um, the export possibilities from this country to other countries and vice versa for that matter. Um, <clears throat> and I commend you for that, I support that. I wanna say um, in the same spirit that um, when you talk about the Indo-Pacific, uh, please don't just think about uh, the rim countries like Japan or Indonesia or Australia or um, you know, New Zealand. There are some 30 jurisdictions uh, throughout the Pacific islands themselves 
um, many of them uh, independent countries. And the one thing they want from us, uh, above all, aside from assistance with, with uh, you know, climate change related consequences is help with economic development. And so the fact is that uh, I, I, I'm a member and uh, co-chair and founder of the Pacific Islands Caucus. We introduced a bill called the Blue Pacific Act, which uh, uh, much of which is in the Competes USICA Act at this point. And it proposed exactly this to enhance our, our trade related expertise out in these countries themselves. So I would just like to uh, reemphasize that to you. Don't forget about the Pacific Island countries themselves, where a sit, where 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 a an investment that for many other countries in the world would not be a significant one, is literally an investment that can make a huge difference in their own economies. Yeah, I hear you loudly and clearly, and I agree. By the way, this afternoon I'm hosting an event with all the um, leaders of the ASEAN countries. And uh, anyway, we're out of time, but I agree and I hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Case. And uh, the chair notes at this point that uh, during the questioning of Mr. Case, the clock actually stopped for about 60 seconds. It's a reminder to us all never to underestimate the resourcefulness of people from Hawaii. Absolutely. Appreciate that. <laughs> this time the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Chris for five minutes of questions. And Mr. Chris, you are muted. Uh, evidently we're having a technical difficulty. Uh, we'll come back to Mr. Chris. There he is. Go ahead. You're recognized, Mr. Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate very much, uh, Secretary, you being with us today. I wanted to start off, if I could ask you, uh, about an issue that everybody's talking about, inflation, and, and what the department or you are trying to do to help assuage the inflation that America is dealing with. Yes, thank you. Sure. So, oh, you guys hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, we are doing a number of things. Um, you know, we think the main driver of inflation is the supply chain bottlenecks and the increased demand due to COVID. Right. Uh, we, we, my team, I'm one of the co-chairs of the president's supply chain task force. We helped a great deal with the port congestion, which is now down significantly. I've done a lot of convenings uh, in the lumber industry between consumers and uh, producers, lumber prices are down 40%. We got rid of the tariffs on steel and aluminum, the Commerce Department did, bringing down prices to those inputs. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said earlier, we're just extremely focused on supply chain, bringing right. together consumers and producers to increase transparency, which we think will bring down inflation. What is it that has slowed down supply chain? Is it related to the pandemic primarily, or are there other factors? Uh, I, th I think it's two things. I think, yes, it's primarily related to the pandemic. Right. You know, we, sh we shut down the global economy all at once. Like yeah. factories all over the world, we shut them down. Yeah. And you, you can't just turn them back on. Also, demand, consumer demand uh, is through the roof. It's just changed during COVID. Um, but the other thing I will say is this has been a problem long time coming. We've lost 25% of our small manufacturers in the United States. They've gone out of business in the past 25 years. Yes. So I saw it in Rhode Island. You cannot have a supply chain if you don't have a manufacturing base. And so we have to invest in manufacturing base in America. Can we do that out of the funds we provided in the bipartisan infrastructure bill to some degree? To some degree, yes. In fact, the broadband work that we're doing is essential to that. But we really need to pass the Competes Act. You know, the Competes Act in the House, the USICA bill in the Senate. It's all about making semiconductors in America, making uh, raw materials or mining in America, making manufacturing, uh, you know, in the ecosystem in America. I think. They look at Germany, for example, 
they have not had this problem because they've been consistent around apprenticeships for manufacturing, small right. loans to small manufacturers. So uh, yes, I think we can do it, but we have to get to the business of doing it. Well, that's great. Um, I'm, I wanna shift to solar uh, energy with you if I could. Um, I know you're aware of the solar tariff petition that is pending before your department, right? I assume so. Um, but I'm concerned by what I'm hearing from solar companies in Florida. Uh, they're having their panel orders canceled or delayed uh, since Commerce has initiated the investigation, I believe, on April 1st. Um, in Florida, surveys of industry participants indi indicate that 850 megawatts of utilities uh, scale projects representing $850 million of solar investment have been canceled or delayed because of the investigation. Can you kind of bring me up to speed on what's happening and what your thoughts might be to the degree you're able? Yeah, thank you. So look, first of all, I hear you and I, I totally share your sense of urgency on this as does the president. Uh, I'm a little limited in what I can say here because this, you know I'm the regulator in this. And so right. this is a yeah, quasi judicial process. Yes. But let me tell you, we are moving as fast as we can to resolve this as quickly as we can. Congress has a statute and I'm just following the statute and implementing it as required, but gonna move it as, you know, as, as quickly as we're able. So is this a petition by one company in California, I believe, if I'm correct? Yes. And what's their reputation? Are they a good actor, bad actor? Don't know. I don't know. It depends who you I'm ask. I'm just ask. You know? No, no. It depends who you ask, right? It's, as with uh, all yeah. investigations, there are some people who say they're a bad actor, some people who say they're a good actor. So my job, as per the law, is yeah. to do the investigation, gather the facts, right. respect the process, and you know, come out as as the facts suggest. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, you have NOAA in your bailiwick, right? Yes. Very important to Rhode Island and Florida and the rest of the country, of course. Um, so the National Weather Service, I think in your testimony, you mentioned the nearly $72 million increase for the Office of Space Commerce. Can you share a little more detail about how that increased funding would be uh, used? Please. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So uh, good news, we just appointed a new head of space commerce who started Monday and we're elevate, we elevating the space commerce to report directly into NOAA headquarters. The main thing that we're working on now is a system, a system to track the commercial traffic in space, sure. kind of the FAA type version of space commerce tracking. It's a cloud computing system, I see. Uh, first of its kind. So that's what the money will be primarily used for. Great, Chairman, I, I, my time is up. So I'll yield back and Madam Secretary, Governor, nice to talk to you. Nice to see you. Thank you, Representative Christ. Uh, Representative Lawrence, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you uh, for yielding Chairman Cartwright. I was happy to host the Deputy Secretary Graves in Detroit last week to discuss how the Department of, Chain of Commerce can further support the manufacturer supplier diversity. It was really um, it, what we say on time meeting and very important. Um, I, I thank the Deputy Secretary for his time and for his support. As Congress considers the Bipartisan Innovation Act, the BIA, we must ensure that women and minorities are not only included, but at the forefront of the economic de development efforts. I am the co-chair of the Democratic Women and second vice chair of the CBC. And I know that women and minorities have been hit the hardest during this pandemic. I have been pleased to see the BIA includes additional support for agencies like the Economic Development Agency, Agency, I have the hiccups, I'm sorry, and the Minority Business Development Agency. So my question is, how does the department intend to support agencies like EBA and the MBDA to ensure 
that minority suppliers are included in the efforts to stabilize our supply chains? And how do you intend to monitor the process? Thank you. So first of all, thank you for hosting uh, Don in Detroit on Monday. He came back excited about the trip. So I thought that was great. Good. Secondly, um, like you, supporting women and minority-owned businesses is one of mm -hmm. my top priorities. Mm -hmm. So through um, the EDA's equity investment priority, they are going to be ensuring that we invest in projects that benefit underserved communities and populations, including women, and making sure that they are more competitive uh, and likely to be funded. And then MBDA, as you know, works exclusively with um, you know, uh, minority-owned businesses, but they have an initiative called the Enterprising Women of Color Initiative, mm -hmm. uh, which is focused on exactly this, women-owned businesses, and what we're working on is increasing contracting opportunities, teaching them how to get contracts with the federal government, access to capital, fostering networks. So uh, I think the proof will be in the pudding, you know, and you should hold us accountable, successfully yeah. measured by the number of women and minority owned businesses that secure funding. But we're, you know, very focused on it. Thank you. And as you know, Detroit manufacturing and innovation is, is the heart and soul of who we are. How will the Department of Commerce use initiatives like the Manufacturing Extension Partnership and build on, on build to scale, promote innovation across the country? Thank you. So um, MEP is one of the president's favorite programs and it supports manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, and th this budget proposes boosting MEP by $125 million. And that money will be used for work on supply chain initiatives, workforce development, a huge issue in our manufacturing base. Mm -hmm. talent. People can't hire. I'm sure you hear it, you know, in your district. All the time. You know, try to find a machinist, try to find someone in tooling. It's really hard. So we're focused mm -hmm. on that. And then also we're very focused on technology. So helping small manufacturers with cybersecurity, adopting technology, 3D printing. We want to enable small manufacturers to be um, technologically capable so that they can be competitive. I have one last question. It's one that's really important to me, the Census Bureau recently released a self-issued report card showing that Black, Latino, and American Indian um, communities were um, under, undercounted. And I want to know what your plan is to look at that report and what what's gonna be the outcome of that because it has a very negative impact on poor and minority communities. Yes. So what I can tell you is that our census director, Rob Santos, is, is laser focused on this. Undercounts are a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And our goal is for the census to be complete and accurate. And, um, you know, every decade there's room for improvement. The 2020 census was really hard given the COVID unprecedented challenges. So we are, uh, we'll continue to follow up with you on this, but it is our top priority. Thank you. I appreciate that. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Lawrence. And uh, uh, we're gonna begin a second round of questioning and I'm gonna recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Secretary Raimondo, uh, I, I may have mentioned, I'm uh, proud to be a co-chair of the Congressional Aluminum Caucus. And so I wanna ask you about aluminum. Uh, we started uh, the aluminum import monitoring system in 2021. And one of the investments uh, that we made in our fiscal year 2022 appropriations bill was increased funding for that system. Uh, question is how effective has the system been in monitoring aluminum imports and are there areas where that can be improved? Thank you. Um, I think it is effective. The Office of Enforcement and Compliance is 
uh, currently, you know, working with the heaviest workload. We have over 650 cases of anti-dumping and countervailing duty. So, uh, you know, this is real unfair dumping, circumvention, evasion, fraud. Uh, by the way, I, I talk to a lot of um, aluminum and steel producers. So I think that um, we appreciate the extra money. And uh, I think it will ensure that we have sufficient staff and resources to, to defend US workers and address these unfair trade practices and, and barriers that hurt US firms and workers. Well, that's right. And, and uh, thank you for mentioning the decline in American small manufacturing over the last 25 years. It's very concerning. Uh, and I, I, I can't help but think that uh, unfair trade practices and dumping uh, have had a big, uh, uh, a big piece of that. Uh, uh, so another investment that we made in FY 2022 was funding to establish a ninth anti-dumping and countervailing duties office to keep pace with the growing caseload associated with these unfair trade practices of many countries. Can you share with us an update on the status of that new office? Yes, thank you. The budget has a $3 million increase for that ninth office. And I think it's important, we need it. By the way, I agree with you. A big part of the reason that elite, especially these small companies go out of business is because of uh, mostly China's unfair practices. And so this, these are the tools we have to stick up for American companies. Good. All right, now I, I wanna to move to uh, NOAA satellites. You are requesting a big funding increase for NOAA's weather, weather satellites. Of course, we have to, we have this constellation of satellites out there and we have to replace them as they age and, and go out of service. But I worry that we're not maximizing the value of our investments. And I understand that quite a bit of the environmental data that is collected gets discarded before we even start our weather forecast models. What is the department doing about that? And, and what is in the budget to maximize the use and the value of the data that we already are collecting at great expense? So I will uh, do my best here. I am not a, a scientist. So if, I, if you need more, of course, I'll put you in touch with people there. But first of all, I can tell you that we are using the advanced technology, especially artificial intelligence and machine learning to maximize the use of the satellite data. But the way these models work, you have to load a huge amount of data into them and then they become more and more accurate. Um, so it's not that we're not using the data, we're using it, we're loading it all into the models. Um, and then the models just become more predictive. The other thing is, but only a certain amount of it is actually useful. Um, the other thing is, we share all the data. So researchers, the private sector, we make it all public. And I think that that's important because that way there everyone can you know, take advantage of the data that um, we collect. All right, now you also mentioned earlier in your testimony, uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology as a way to build up our manufacturing uh, capacity in the United States, uh, NIST, uh, is uh, something uh, uh, that China has produced its own versions of most, if not all of the Manufacturing USA institutes currently overseen by NIST. And so the question is, how does the funding for Manufacturing USA institutes compare to that of their Chinese counterparts? Yeah, so we were ahead of them. They copied us, but now they're ahead of us. They copied the design of NIST in Manufacturing USA to stimulate their own manufacturing investment. But now they have 21 centers. We have 16. Right, they so what's the plan, Secretary? Well, we need the money. To, the money that we're asking for here, $97 million, will support five more and will allow us to start to catch up. Thank you. Uh, I recognize our ranking member, Mr. Adderhold, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to follow up, up on the uh, what I mentioned earlier and what's been referred to the, the Chips for America Act. 
Uh, as you know, there is, is a lot of support on Capitol Hill for restoring the United States leadership in the semiconductor manufacturing and the mitigating the national security risk, which is related to dependence on unsecure uh, microelectronics supply chain. Uh, if the Chips for America Act receives substantial funding uh, currently being considered by Congress, uh, you will be tasked with administering the incentives to increase domestic semiconductor manufacturing capacity. Uh, given this need for more domestic uh, semiconductor capacity, that it's already very acute, and that national uh, security concerns are not just merely hypothetical, does the administration have a plan to ease or to assist with regulations and permitting process to help expedite fab construction timelines? Uh, after all, NEPA's process alone could delay the construction of a new fab by five years or more. Yes, thank you. Um, this is an issue that we're tracking closely and I'd like to work with you on it. There may be a role for Congress. You're right, sometimes these um, Facilities take two, three years to be permanent, and we don't have that time. So I'd be very happy to follow up with you on it. Thank you. That's, uh, I appreciate that. How, how will you balance factors like job creation with other factors like the ability to advance U.S. strategic, economic, and national security goals and awarding incentive grants? Um, the primary objective is to increase production of chips in the whole supply chain all kinds of chips, memory, logic, analog, sophisticated. That's the job we have to do. As a consequence, we will be creating tens of thousands of jobs. So I see them as, you know, connected. Thank you. Uh, following up again on a question was referred to earlier about the Office of Space Commerce um, and congratulations on the installation of the uh, new uh, director of Office of Space Command, which you uh, referred to, uh, NOAA's proposal to elevate the office to report to the deputy undersecretary and to increase the office budget by nearly 72 million, I think reflects the important role that the office plays in protecting America's interest in space. Given the rapid development of America's commercial space sector, uh, it's vital that the office maintains a pace with industry to ensure that we continue to set standards <clears throat> and lead from the front. As the uh, outgoing director noted, key to the new director's success will be access to you and also to your deputy, as well as to the men and women there at the Commerce Department, uh, where there'll be many different tools that uh, they'll be available to them. My question, Madam Secretary, do you agree with the assessment and can you assure uh, this subcommittee that the new director will have your support for this level of access and coordination across the department? Yes and yes. In fact, uh, my deputy is uh, managing this very directly and we've elevated the reporting of space commerce into NOAA headquarters. So yes, I agree and yes, we will do it. Thank you. Uh, it has just recently come to my attention uh, uh, that the uh, by recent action by the government of Mexico has shut down a facility that is owned by Vulcan Materials. It's based in my uh, home state of Alabama. And it's my understanding that this was done in direct violation of Mexican court orders and will ha have a dramatic effect, impact on the av av availability of aggregate for road construction, port expansion products, liquid natural gas construction, and a lot of other economic development projects in the southeastern part of the United States. Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas will really bear the brunt of these actions by the Mexican government because these states are heavily dependent on imported rock due to the, to the geological conditions off the Gulf Coast. This has the potential to have a ripple effect on the rest of the United States as well, because aggregates for island states will have to be diverted to make up for lost imports. If there is no resolution, uh, projects will be delayed and they'll be, or they'll be stopped. And the cost of construction will significantly increase on top of the challenges posed by inflation that we're seeing across the board. Um, 
is the Department of Commerce aware of this issue? Are you aware of the issue? And what uh, is being done to ensure that our trade partners are abiding by trade agreement com commitments? Yes. I am not aware of the issue, which doesn't mean the department is not aware of it. Sure. I will follow up with you today and see how we can help. But okay. they need to live up to their commitments. I met with Ambassador Salazar just a week ago and re-emphasized that with him. Uh, but anyways, let's follow up. Okay, I look forward to hearing from your office. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Adderholt. At this time, the chair recognizes Representative David Trone of Maryland for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, Secretary, Madam Secretary, thanks for joining you, joining us today. It's great to see you again. Um, Department of Commerce uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology is headquartered in my district, NIST. It's the world's leading agency for creating critical measurement solutions and promoting equitable standards. However, the state of the facilities at their headquarters in Gaithersburg is in desperate need of renovations. Uh, these are scientists and precision data is at the core, which means they don't always paint the most vivid picture of why they need better funding. But that's something we can do. Waterline ruptures, flooding of an entire floors, corrosion, rampant mold. These scientists are trying to accomplish their life's work and are set back again and again by the conditions um, they're engaged in transformational work, which has benefits across government and the private sector. We owe them basic functioning laboratories. So Madam Secretary, what is the percent of the facilities on the Gaithersburg campus at NIST that's in poor to critical condition? Hi, good morning. It's, it's uh, about 40%, as I understand it. You and I visited the facility. We uh, did. Which I enjoyed. And actually, my deputy secretary is there today. It's an old building. You know, we, we cannot sugarcoat this. It is an old building. At the moment, we're prioritizing projects that have the most negative impact on critical operations. Um, we've asked for more funding, you know, in this. The 2023 budget is a is 50% above last year's budget for construction of research facilities. It's 120 million, and I hope I hope you and your colleagues will, you know, fund every bit of that because, as you know, the stuff these guys do—artificial intelligence, quantum 5G—matters, and the facility needs help. No, you and I had a great visit there, and I'm delighted your deputies there. Uh, the 120 million is—it's just—I don't think it's going to be enough from what we understand. Um, do you have any estimate of what the accidents, like we had, you know, cost up there? on the waterline water line breaks uh, and how much that's cost the taxpayers uh, when things simply fell apart. Yeah, uh, I can find out. What I do know is that we spend, you know, $50 million a year towards routine maintenance and repair. And uh, on top of that, you know, another 7 million on equipment replacement. So it definitely, the numbers do add up. To try and get the construction um, for construction and the renovation. What do you think we need? Uh, I know you asked for 120 million, and everyone's trying to be conservative, but this is such a key facility. You know, we've got to ensure this maintenance backlog uh, gets taken care of. Uh, what number do you think would get us on a path that we could do over multiple years uh, to get this facility back to where it used to be as the world's you know leading organization for technology? measurement and standards? You know, we think it's to a couple hundred million dollars a year for 10 years. Uh, and by the way, the, in the Build Back Better, the president was uh, proposing the, this, that scale of investments. Yeah, that's the number that we've heard also, $200 million um, each over a period of a number of years uh, to get us back to where we need to be. And uh, this organization also does such great work with pro the private sector where they connect, you know, on an ongoing basis. And we saw that when we visited there. So it's a beautiful collaboration of government and the private sector together uh, to you know, move, move us forward. So uh, we'll be happy to keep working on this. I know Chairman Cartwright's aware of the situation. Uh, we hope to pay a visit up there shortly 
and uh, and take a look at it, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you, Madam Secretary, for being here, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Tron, and I look forward to that visit as well to NIST in your district. Um, we're going to start a, a third round of questioning since we're down to a dwindling number of members, Madam Secretary. Um, and I want to uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, it, we've talked a fair amount about uh, war in today's testimony, and uh, there's a, a shooting war. There's a kinetic war going on, obviously, in Ukraine, but the entire world has been at cyber war for quite a while now. Um, and uh, uh, we catch it in America. Our companies are attacked, our individuals are attacked. Um, and we have a, a number of agencies addressing this threat, but part of it is uh, within the uh, Department of Commerce. Uh, you have in the Department of Commerce, the Bureau of Industry and Security, the BIS. Now in October, 2021, the BIS published an interim final rule establishing new export controls on certain cybersecurity tools. And in November, BIS added a number of companies to the department's entity list, in other words, bad actors list, based on evidence that these entities developed and supplied spyware to foreign governments in an effort maliciously to target government officials, journalists, businesses, and also embassy workers. So Secretary Raimondo, what effect have your department's actions and BIS had on limiting adversarial use of our cybersecurity technologies? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the rule just went into effect in March. Uh, so it's a little bit early to say, but we are already denying, I can tell you already, we are denying hardware and software and related technologies that can be used in malicious cyber activities um, or misused, as you say, by authoritarian governments. So uh, I guess a significant effect is what I would say. And I think as the months go by, it'll be even more significant. Well, of course, uh, here at the, uh, the House Appropriations Committee, Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, and Science, what we're up to is making sure that you have adequate resources to get your job done. And uh, that's my question here, is how adequate are uh, commerce's resources and capabilities to track the effectiveness of its tools against this growing cyber threat? And how will your 2023 budget request for uh, information and communications technology security aid in your ability to respond. Yeah, thank you. I'm really happy you brought this up. We really, really need the support on the ICTS. Uh, we are asking for $36 million. That's for 114 positions. We need it. I don't know what else to say. The, the Trump administration did a executive order requiring the Commerce Department to look at the ICTS supply chain but without giving any resources. And uh, this is, you know, we're developing from scratch an entire uh, process here. So we need to hire, we need to draft the regulations, create and administer a whole preclearance process, assist with litigation. So we, yeah, we, we need the resources in order to do this correctly and protect the United States of America and our telecom networks. I'm glad to hear you say that. And let's keep talking about that, Madam Secretary. At uh, this time, I, I recognize our ranking member, Mr. Adderholt, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, NOAA operates two highly specialized Lockheed P-3 Hurricane, Hurricane Hunter aircrafts, which were built in the 1970s. And I understand they'll reach the end of their service life around 2030. Uh, hurricane hunters are important because they do improve a hurricane prediction path by 15 to 20% and intensity forecast by 10 to 15%. Uh, hurricane hunter saves lives and it saves untold millions of in, um, evacuation related costs. Replacement aircraft will take multiple years to build and meet uh, NOAA's needs. Uh, my question to you, Madam Secretary, is the department planning to replace NOAA's hurricane hunters to ensure and to make, make for certain that there is no gap in the coverage of the one 
of the once existing aircrafts is taken offline and retired. Yeah, I would say yes. Um, by the way, I come from Rhode Island. I was the governor, went through hurricanes. So I really understand how important this is. We are going to need new hurricane hunters in the future. And so right now, NOAA is creating a plan to address the requirement. Once that plan is finalized, I would love to sit down with you in this committee and go through the funding needs so we can make sure that we you know, get what we need in order to replace the aging hurricane hunters. Well, I hope I hope the, the planning process can be expedited because as you because uh, 2030 will be here, you know, before we know it. But uh, does do you have the, the preparations in FY23 to ensure that, you know, there's no gap uh, once uh, that aircraft is retired? Yes, we think we do. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let me, uh, I know it's a couple of my colleagues referred to a broadband and uh, that's certainly an important issue to many of us uh, on this uh, subcommittee as well as it is in the entire Congress. Uh, NTIA is expected to release a notice of uh, funding opportunity for roughly 42 billion in grants to states and territories through the broadband equity access and deployment program. The law clearly states that states must first serve all unserved areas before serving underserved areas. Given the amount of funding some states may receive, it seems possible that a state could award funding to both unserved and underserved communities concurrently. And this will, could result in uh, overbuilding and result in unserved areas being further left behind. My question, how do you intend to monitor a state's administration of these funds? Yeah, 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 great question. It's unserved first. That is non-negotiable. And we're telling that to every state. Every single state has to give us a plan. We will review the plan in coordination with them. And the plan has to guarantee unserved first. Once everyone is served, then we can look at, you know, underserved. So it's, um, it's clear in the statute and we plan to administer it state by state. By the way, by tomorrow, by Friday of this week, every single state will have a point person at NTIA. So uh, you, your state will have a point person. I have sent a letter to every governor. I'm planning to do follow-up phone calls with every governor just to make sure we're really tight coordinated with every state. Well, I'm glad to hear your commitment to the, uh, to the fact that the unserved population will be given the priority. Uh, the Infrastructure Act requires uh, NTIA to award funds only after the FCC's updated broadband maps are completed. Uh, as a requirement to receive funding, will you require states to base their funding decision off these FCC completed maps to avoid overbuilding? And number two, how can you, or how do you intend to uh, enforce that? Uh, yes, is the number one, is the first question, yes. And secondly, they're not, we're not gonna give them any money until we have the maps. So it's actually not that hard to enforce. They're going to get a planning grant of $5 million to work on their state plan. They'll work with us to do that. Uh, but the big money isn't going to flow until we have the maps and they can prove to us it'll be unserved, underserved. Okay. All right. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Adderholt. Well, now, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, you are from Rhode Island and you served a very successful uh, tenure as the, the governor of the Ocean State. Uh, and maybe one of your, your best attributes is that you're able to decipher heavy Connecticut accents. Now, we've been uh, joined by the overall chair of House Appropriations, uh, Chair Rosa DeLauro, who is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very, very much. Uh uh, Mr. Chairman, and a Connecticut accent, yes, but the real issue between Rhode Island and Connecticut is who has the most Italian Americans, uh, and the number goes back and forth. So, uh, and I, 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 
I, I challenge the secretary on that and also our colleague, David Cicilline. So, uh, but Madam Secretary, how wonderful, wonderful to see you and say, thank you so much. I apologize for being late. Uh, I'm chairing a, a hearing in, in Labor HHS. So, but I, I wanted to have the opportunity to see you and, and obviously have, have, have a question. And I, I think you, you know, you know that I've authored the legislation on National Critical Capabilities and Defense Act. Um, this is about providing outbound investment screening, a mechanism, if you will. Uh, I've done that in a bipartisan way with Representative Pascrell, uh, uh, Representatives Pascrell, Sparks, and Fitzpatrick. Um, it's a bipartisan, bicameral approach. What it is all about is assessing and addressing um, where necessary the outsourcing of supply chains and capabilities. If we've got something that's going uh, offshore, what is that? What 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 is the uh, consequences of that uh, 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 to, to the U.S.? Uh, we we keep re relearning the lesson of what we've done to under uh, under uh, uh, undermine critical needs in, uh, in the U.S. And it's in the, the bill that you know so well and you're a champion of is the competes legislation, uh, which is now before a conference committee. Uh, it was your department released data showing that critical risks that exist. The bipartisan US-China Economic and Security Review Commission issued a report and it used Department of Commerce data showing that R&D expenditures by US multinationals in China grew at a rate three times faster than their R&D investments here in the US. There's other data that shows how companies are outsourcing America's economic, national security at an alarming rate. And I might add that outbound investment review was unanimously agreed to by the same bipartisan review commission last year. Legislation has been on the table for a while. You've commented publicly on the issue. In March, you said that you support enhancing the US's outbound investment screening. The conference is now formally underway or will be underway this, this evening. And what I wanted to do is to check in with you and with the administration about the support of this bipartisan bicameral piece of legislation and what it means in terms of our letting our, our capabilities slip through our fingers uh, as they go offshore. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming, by the way. Also, for the record, on the record, the Italian food is better in Rhode Island. Than oh, absolutely, not. absolutely <laughs> not. Absolutely not. Um, in any event, uh, so listen, this is a really important issue, and I am uh, eager to work with you on it and hopeful that some beefed up outbound investment screening provision is included in the final version of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, this is a matter of national security. You know, there is a great deal of outbound, US outbound investment going into China in emerging technology, for example, exactly the areas where we, we don't want the Chinese to have our money or our know-how. Um, so it's national security, but it's also job security. Like you said, we need to be investing in America, building this stuff in America, protecting our assets, our companies, our technology in America. So, um, you know, it's a complicated issue, but the Commerce Department is eager to work with you and the colleagues in the Senate to include outbound investment screening um, protections in, in this bill, in, in this conference. I thank you so, so much, and I want to work with you, and we'll continue to speak about it. I mean, I, I we so so many examples, and a portion of this the, this bill is about what happened with our semiconductor industry, and we've experienced during the pandemic. My God, the you, you know the ingredients for drugs, which is is gone elsewhere. And finally, for me, the issue is, and I and I believe the case is for you. We have to not just be a consuming nation; we have to be a nation that builds, and that is what our manufacturing. Uh, 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 efforts are all about, and let's recapture it. And uh, uh, and I thank you. I thank you for helping to lead the charge in all of that efforts. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. But you have to come to Connecticut for great Italian food. So anyway, thank you. Good to see you. Bye. So, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and uh, the chair recognizes Representative Stephen Palazzo for five minutes of questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank the ranking member and Madam Secretary. Thank you for being here today. You know, commerce plays a crucial role in our economy with initiatives in my district ranging from NOAA's activities at the National Data Buoy Center 
to aquaculture research that promotes the development of a stronger, more sustainable domestic seafood industry. I would also like to note that my alma mater, the University of Southern Mississippi, is a partner in the NOAA-funded Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute led by the University of Rhode Island in your home state. The OECI is focused on ocean exploration and mapping in deep and remote areas of the U.S. exclusive economic zone to characterize the nation's vast ocean territory, develop new technologies, and engage future generations of ocean scientists, engineers, and stakeholders. As I'm sure you recall from your visit to the Mississippi Gulf Coast last summer, USM is working closely with industry and small business partners, state and local governments, as well as federal partners like NOAA and the Navy to strengthen the region's coastal resiliency and improve the nation's economic and military competitiveness by growing and diversifying its blue economy. To help with this, Congress passed the Commercial Engagement Through Ocean Technology Act, commonly called CNOTE, and this bill highlights the unique role that non-defense interests such as NOAA, academia, and the private sector play in the advancement of uncrewed systems which gather a wide range of ocean data with uses for coastal resilience and forecasting, fishery management, navigation, and national security. The need to ensure a strong blue economy and the defense of our nation is something we can all agree on. As the Department of Commerce strategizes how it can best position the United States to compete in the blue economy and on a global scale, particularly with China, what in your budget request enables Mississippi and other states in the nation to continue their efforts. Thank you. Um, and as you say, I did visit last year with Senator Wicker and I enjoyed the visit. Uh, there, as we've been talking about the, the NOAA budget, uh, we are uh, requesting increases for NOAA uh, and much of that uh, could be beneficial to the work that is happening there. Um, also, we've increased we've asked for increases in the EDA and specifically in the EDA, we'll be looking to target like projects exactly like what you're talking about, which is to say um, economic development that ties into the strengths of the region. So, and in MBDA, we're looking to set up the regional um, rural business centers, which I've talked to Wicker about extensively. So. Yeah, I'd be happy to get together and kind of look at the details, but I think between NOAA and EDA specifically, there'll be a good opportunity for, for, for you to um, enhance the work that's happening there. Well, great, thank you for that. Um, last question, how does NOAA plan to support the growing technological needs for uncrewed systems innovation, such as infrastructure for data storage and accessibility? Yeah, so we are uh, believers in uncrewed um, uh, devices, and we are researching that and hoping to uh, use more of it. There's the research budget in NOAA. Uh, it, we're asking for increases, and some of that will be put into the um, uncrewed systems. All right, well, Madam Secretary, thank you so much. And um, to Chairman Cartwright, it seems like uh, every time we have a hearing, we have another committee hearing at the same time. So thank you for your patience with me uh, jumping on and off. So I appreciate you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Palazzo. And I feel your pain, my dear colleague. And <laughs> Madam Secretary, uh, we've come to the end of this hearing. Uh, uh, you've done a nice job. Uh, you've endured our questions for three rounds and uh, uh, you've testified for almost two hours without a break. Thank you for visiting with us. Uh, and uh, uh, I look forward to continuing uh, to work closely with you uh, as we do, do right by the United States Department of Commerce. Thank you so much. At this point, this hearing is adjourned.